Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're really excited to have you here with us today because we're going to be talking about one of my personal favorite topics. So, of course, I would love today. Um, learning from next-gen leaders, Anam Kadir and Christian Celeste Tate, joining us today from the Bridge Span, Bridge Span Group. Say that fast three times. Hey, welcome, <laughs> you two. Thanks so much, Julia. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks, Julia. We are thrilled to have you here because I've got to say, this topic comes up so much. Every place I go, everywhere. But you know who's not included in the conversation? Big surprise. Next-gen leaders, right? It's just a bunch of people, like old people like me, yammering <laughs> on and complaining about it and not engaging in our next-gen leaders. And so... Whew, we got to stop that train wreck and we got to have you really explain to us what you are seeing and how you navigate this. So before we move any further, um, I really want to say welcome to our co-hosts. We have been debuting them over the last couple of months. They are amazing. And I hope you have really come to find their wisdom and their advice as uh, valuable as I have. They are so much better than me, so much wiser than me. There, there are episodes on them and Christian where I'm like, why am I on the show? I should just let them do it because they're so great. But anyway, I'm really, really excited to have such an amazing group. I'm also super excited to thank all of our presenting sponsors. And most of these folks have been with us since day one when we started five years ago now more than 1,100 episodes. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, our newest show, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. Okay, Christian Celeste Tate and Adnan Kadar, welcome, welcome, welcome. Talk to us about what Bridge, the Bridge Span Group, I don't know why I can't say that, the Bridge Span Group does. It's still early on a Monday. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anam Kadir. I'm uh, with the Bridgeband Group, as Julia mentioned. Um, we are uh, an advisory organization, a nonprofit ourselves, and advise a number of high net worth individuals, foundations, nonprofit organizations, primarily on questions related to strategy and organizational effectiveness. Uh, we've also done a fair amount of work doing leadership development, especially with smaller community-based organizations, um, and are very keen to take a lot of the insights from our client work and also share them out with the world. So you may have come across our, our knowledge pieces in Stanford Social Innovation Review, Harvard Business Review, mm -hmm. um, and then also in conversations like today. So excited to share what we've also been observing from Next Gen Leaders. Christian, talk to us about what it is that you specifically do with the Bridge Span Group. Yeah, so first of all, Julia, thanks for having us. Very exciting to be here and, and happy to be on the show. Um, Anam and I are here because we just finished co-hosting season three of Bridge Span's Dreaming in Color podcast. The podcast was started in 2021 by Bridge Span partner Darren Isom out of San Francisco. And the point of the, of the podcast is to elevate leaders of color uh, within the social sector, from nonprofits, mm -hmm. from philanthropy, and really spotlight their lived experiences and professional experiences that brought them to the leadership roles that they're in today. And so we're, we're really excited to share some of the takeaways, some of the perspectives that, that we gathered from that podcast. Um, and I should note, season four of the podcast has already aired and is uh, available on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Good job. Good job. Well, um, I will have you, I will task you with reminding us at the end of this episode um, so, so that our viewers and listeners don't miss it, because I think this is just such a vital conversation and I couldn't be more thrilled to have the two of you on. So when we talk about trends and we talk about next gen leadership and there's like all this mystery and there's all this angst. And there's all of this, I would call behavior um, that is misunderstood, not discussed. I mean, and we could go on and on and on, but, but you have this phrase and I just love it. The value of willing to fail for something. Holy smokes. What does that mean? Yeah, th this is one of the most powerful messages from season three to me personally. 
This came from a conversation, episode one of the podcast with uh, Michael Tubbs, who is the former mayor of Stockton, California. He was the biggest mayor of a big city in U.S. history. Um, and he's currently running for lieutenant governor of California. And he was. this came from one of his reflections on his re-election campaign, which he didn't end up winning. And he talked about how it encouraged him to reflect not only on what he wanted to succeed for, but also on what he was willing to fail for. And he talked about how that metric or that that measure is such a different bar that really requires you to reflect on what's important to you and what you're willing to go out on a limb for. Mm-hmm. You know, Adam, one of the things that we talk about a lot, I would say people of my generation, is the notion of risk mm-hmm. and how are we going to embrace risk? And we, I feel like risk is a dirty word now. You know, that there's so much fear. And I think especially with a young leader, they're just afraid of being clobbered by making a mistake. Um, What do you say to that? And what have you seen? Yeah, I mean, I'll say risk looks different for everyone, right? And I think that also um, holds true for even the younger generation. Um, I think about when I started my career and kind of the upbringing I had in a you know, South Asian household of, you know, put your head down, do good work, you know, don't, don't speak up too much or, you know, push the boundaries. But what I have appreciated, especially of my colleagues and others I've engaged in the sector is sometimes you can't even imagine what's possible unless you're willing to try to push those boundaries and test where they are. And so I know sometimes that can feel really antagonistic in in ways or, you know, create, um, you know, what people call trouble internally in organizations Mm -hmm. But it's actually that pushing, right, that has led us to better places. We think about the role of student movements, even during the civil rights movement, right? Like younger generations have been imagining and visioning a better future for us all. Mm -hmm. So how do we take that energy and that passion to actually even imagine what's possible um, to help shape our future? Mm -hmm. Okay, now... I'm sorry, Christian, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just add to that real quick. I, I love that point, Anna. And I think, you know, the, the theme of our season of Dreaming in Color was reimagining our world. And we intentionally spoke with world builders who are doing really innovative work. And one thing, one sort of through line that we noted is that, you know, when we're building a world that doesn't exist today, building a world that we've never seen before, there's no way forward that doesn't involve risk. And we're not always going to take the right turns. We're not always going to make the right steps, but we have to be willing to make the wrong turns and then get back on track. Mm -hmm. And we see so much inspiration coming from young leaders, particularly young leaders of color who are putting themselves out there in order to navigate us to that better world. So Christian, let me follow up with that because this is like an internal conversation that we have a lot with ourselves. I mean, sometimes we identify it as confidence or being brash or, or being, you know, powerful or whatever. Are you, both of you, and I'll ask you both, are you at your age and a place in your career having this conversation with other leaders? Or is this just something that's like part of your, your DNA and your work ecosystem? Yeah, I appreciate the question because it's certainly not part of my DNA, right? I think we're all young leaders and again, particularly leaders of color are all working to overcome some level of imposter syndrome, some level of (laughs) navigating spaces where we historically have and haven't fit into. And I think for me, part of this challenge is accepting that I've not completely shed that. And I don't know when or if I will completely shed that. And yet I can still show up in those spaces in bold and imaginative ways. I love yeah, it. Thank and, you. And Julie, even I know just before the show started, we had also, we were reflecting a little bit about gender roles, whether it's in the workplace or in society more broadly. Yeah. And, you know, to put yourself, you know, to, to, to the extent it's helpful for folks to even use that as an entry point of where, um, what are the forces at play in different types of conversations? Mm-hmm. Or I even think about Bridge Band's workplace. We work in teams. What are power dynamics with the most senior person on the team and the most junior person on the team? That gets exacerbated when there's gender dynamics at play, when there's racial or ethnic uh, dynamics also at play. Um, And I think also age, uh, that also comes into play. 
And so, you know, in order to actually, if we truly believe that diversity leads us to better answers, better ideas, how do we actually truly harness that and recognize where someone might not be speaking up because they're afraid to take a risk? How do we create the spaces that enable and foster those ideas and, you know, broader dialogue? Um, and it's a little bit of a tangent to the, the, the question that you asked. But I think is also important to recognize how we all individually show up. And as Christian name, how do we reflect how we show up and unlearn some of the things, even as a woman, as a woman of color, I, you know, I'm trying to undo so that way I can show up for others in the space as well. Right. Well, it's such a journey because, you know, you, you're taught as a leader, I mean, from the grade school playground, you know, what gives you more power? What gives you more authority? How do you get other, the other kids to follow you? All of these messages. And then um, you go into your work environment and then there are all these other things pinging around the room, of which you don't always understand or can identify, right? Mm -hmm. But you know something wackadoo is going on. You know that wackadoo, that's a definite uh, management word. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's talk very about technical. this other you very technical, very technical. Um, I got that that in my uh, MBA. Okay, <laughs> celebrating your success and promoting yourself. Now, this I think is a fascinating thing because, pardon me, Christian, but I feel like this is a gender issue. I feel like kids, you know, the girls are taught to be reticent and and like push off success and don't promote yourself, don't be too brash, but that the boys are super encouraged super encouraged. Like you need to, you know, yay team, when you cross home plate, you know, you, you, you do a dance or you, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm wondering what the two of you see in this, in this part of, I would say a cultural shift. So Anam, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, I'll say, I think the gender dynamic as you named is super real. And then just also mm -hmm. other lines of difference um, when it comes mm -hmm. to thinking about and celebrating your own successes. One of the things that stuck with me from um, this recent podcast season was my conversation with Arlen Hamilton from Backstage Capital. Uh, she's a woman of color, identifies as LGBTQ, um, and has her own venture capital firm specifically to invest in women, people of color, basically anyone who she calls as underestimated, which I love that term. Love that. And she, you know, she defined, she talked about how success is a form of activism. Not only does it help mm -hmm. sustain you when things get hard or there's pushback, right? It's to actually mm -hmm. recognize those smaller, and sometimes they're small, sometimes they're big, but what are those milestones and in, in progress mm -hmm. that you're still achieving to keep you going? But she also noted how it, it's also a model for others, right? Especially yeah. if you don't have role models that look like you, whether it's in your firm, whether it's in your organization, how do you look to see what others are doing? And when they mm -hmm. celebrate their successes, that also gives you, that paints a possibility for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll just share an idea of just celebrating your successes, both what it might do for you, but also what it can mean for others. I'd never thought of it that way. Christian, how do you see this playing out? Yeah, so I, I totally agree that this is something that we see across all sorts of lines of difference, um, mm -hmm. certainly gender included. I think one thing that stands out to me is the commonality, though, of that experience. I think this is something that in our advisory work, we see very frequently where um, leaders who are deeply invested in the work that they're doing feel like they are constantly pushing a ball up a hill or constantly working against the tide. And so they don't often give themselves the chance to step back and take stock of what has gone well and, and take a minute to appreciate the progress that, that they've made. Um, so I think... Mm -hmm. While it's particularly true for leaders of color and, and female leaders, I think it's something that all of us can learn from, regardless mm -hmm. of, of the identity that you hold. You know, that's somewhat heartbreaking, because if you think about uh, Anam's amazing comment, it's not just for yourself, but how do you model that behavior for other leaders so that they're like, yeah, I can do this, or this should be a part of my my leadership and how I express myself. Um, that is a fundamental issue. If you're not finding enough time or space to have a reflection, because it seems to me that, I mean, Christian, to your point, um, you don't make a lot of change and you just keep on that struggle 
if you're not acknowledging success in in all of its forms, right? It's not always apparent. Yeah. And I mean, part of it is also like working on issues in the social sector is really hard, <laughs> yeah. right? A lot of these issues have been at play for decades, if not oh, longer. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, things aren't going to change overnight, but what can we be doing to leave things better for the next generation after us? Yeah. You know, and in those, it is still in those small, they're not always small. Sometimes they're still big milestones. Um, mm-hmm. But even those baby steps that, you know, help us get to that future that we're all imagining and dreaming about. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's, I'm oh, sorry, Julian. No, 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 no. I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I, I, I think that's, I think that's completely true on him. And I think it reminds me of my conversation with Robert Rooks at the end, the last episode of the season. He works, mm-hmm. the CEO of Reform Alliance, and they work for uh, criminal legal reform, particularly in the probation and parole space. And he had talked about these same themes and especially how important it is to celebrate successes when you're working against such active pushback, because Mm -hmm. one of the tools that that opposition will use is to tell you that it's hopeless. Mm -hmm. And if you're not taking the time to appreciate the progress and the hope that really does exist within the work, it can be really hard to sustain that effort in the long term. Mm -hmm. You know, Christian, I love that you said that because I think that's like, super true. And we, we forget that. I also want to get your take on this. And that is donors love winners. And it's a harsh thing and a brutal thing to say. I mean, hell, if we needed that example, the last 24 hours in our nation and the amount of political money that's been raised, um, you know, do you see that in play where you've got to promote yourself so that you you get more stakeholders involved financially and just with other resources? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's certainly a, a dynamic that exists. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what my mind goes to more is how we can push each other within the social sector such that we're not playing into that trope, right? I think yeah. this goes back to a lot of the the dynamics that you brought up, the the, the things that were sort of brought up to, to think about on the playground as to what yeah. cultivates buy-in and leadership. And while we need to acknowledge that those those things are real, having real impacts, we also need to find ways to overcome that by challenging and calling in one another. Mm-hmm. I love that. Um, I'm, I love that. I'm, I'm even working with a, 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 a couple of funder clients right now, and we are having that same conversation of like, well, where has there been unintentional king making in your past work? Like reflecting, you know, classic bridge man project, reflecting on their strategy, helping them think about what's to come. And some of it is like, oh, actually, we just need to hold each other accountable and name where that dynamic might be be being played. And some of that actually, you know, comes from hearing feedback from grantees, et cetera, right? And so some of this is, you know, to to Christian's point, how do we not play into that trope? How do we create the processes, the self-awareness? It's like Mm -hmm. a, it's a heart game. It's a mind game. It's like, you know, a structural game, systems game, processes game to actually get to that. Um, Mm -hmm. But recognizing that there's a lot of forces at play that can pull us in those in those directions. that Actually, I think many of us would agree isn't isn't ideal for all of us. Well, Anam, it seems to me, too, like it's it's a conversation, right, Mm -hmm. that people won't even they'll be like, oh, wow, I didn't think of that. Right. I mean, it's I think it's um, so much to me. I think that what the two of you have said, it goes back to almost a communication standard. Like if we're not talking about this, then we're just fumbling around and and people, I think genuinely, this is my Pollyanna approach, but I think people genuinely, genuinely want to succeed and move forward. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but if we don't have these conversations, then we don't have the tools necessarily to intellectualize even the concept, let alone talk about it. Let's um, go on to the next thing. And I, I'm really interested. First of all, I'm so impressed with the two of you. I got to say, the two of you like give me hope so that as I and my generation step out and step back, that we do have amazing leadership behind us. I think a lot of people fear that we don't have great leadership coming behind us. And so then people like me hang on, you know, with our, <laughs> our nails for too long. Right. Um, and so how do we rewrite that script for with the next gen narrative? Um, Christian, let's start with you and, and maybe you can weave in some of your experiences with your the seasons of your podcast. But just as that next gen leader yourself, 
what do you see and how do we rewrite the script? Yeah, so I think it's a couple things. One thing that that my mind goes to is normalizing concepts that were once considered to be radical. That's something that author Bria Baker okay. talked a lot about in the third episode of the season. She's written a lot about land back principles and has written about reparations as a tool of hope and progress. And reparations is a great example of something that a generation ago was considered uh, absolutely radical. And yet today we have real conversations about what that might look like and who that might benefit and how we can all stand to gain. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's about making parts of this movement irresistible, right? Talking mm -hmm. about these concepts in a way that can call everybody in and paint a picture that is characterized by beauty such that others can rally behind it. Mm -hmm. I also, it makes me think, and, and Anam, I don't want to steal your thunder here, but it, it makes me think of your conversation with Rebecca Dixon, who talked a lot about embodying the destination in the journey and making mm -hmm. sure that the way that we move is not just about where we're going, but that it, you know, we're moving in a way that that really lives up to the goals that we're seeking. Yeah, um, that thought, that thought share with us. Mind. Yeah, okay. share with us what that that means to you and what you've seen. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that stuck out to me from my conversation with Rebecca um, was just this notion of like sometimes how you work together is almost mm -hmm. just as important as the work itself. Yeah. And I think, again, that speaks back to where are we recognizing power dynamics to actually kind of unleash the full potential of a group's brilliance? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we have the right conversation, et cetera? And I appreciate you, Julia, naming too, that a lot of this does begin with conversation. But sometimes conversation is also hard, oh, right? Yeah. I think we're, <laughs> we're in a moment that, you know, power dynamics, internal power dynamics uh, within the workplace aside, like we're in a very polarized environment. It's mm -hmm. hard to you know, for folks to even see like dignity in, in others. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it just makes it makes it really hard. So just, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, going back to this piece of sometimes how you do that work, how do you mm -hmm. actually bring people in? How do you um, help them see that shared vision and that sh shared mm -hmm. humanity um, mm -hmm. can go a long way. The other piece I was going to speak to on your prompt about um, the next gen narrative is I, I feel I'm feeling it now because I'm like somewhere, I don't know if I would call it middle management at Bridgespan, but somewhere between like, you know, full leadership and more junior team members who are now coming in. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm trying to embrace more and more of like just the listening perspective, mm -hmm. recognizing that there is still such wisdom from our elders and our ancestors oh, yeah. and a lot of like ground that they have treaded that mm -hmm. we can learn from. And mm -hmm. how do I still not shut things down or shut ideas down from younger generations who are holding that vision and new possibility for what our future looks like. And so mm -hmm. there is a bit of like, even in this next gen piece, like how do we just continue to listen to each other and hold both pieces right. at the same time, which can be really hard. Right. And I, I see myself being like, Oh, I don't, that's not quite how I would have done it. Or, Oh no, I, you know, but there is, you know, to Christian's point earlier, there's a lot of progress that's made even in just the learning and the journey of like, let's try, let's try to something. And if it fails, we learn something, right? Right. Um, I call that the role those perspectives. Yeah, I call that the role your eyes have it. It happens on both ends, you know, like mm -hmm. the older leadership rolling their eyes and being like, oh my God, you just don't get it. Or you're not ready. And then the younger ones are like, oh my God, you got to leave. You just don't get it, right? It's, it's yeah. just this, it's just such a fascinating dynamic to me. Fascinating. Yeah. And it's, I, I totally agree. And it's almost easy to overlook this as a solution because it's so simple. But mm -hmm. you, I mean, you said it when we started the conversation, Julia, that these conversations often happen in rooms that don't include the perspectives of young leaders. Yeah. And if the goal is to create a narrative that resonates with young people, probably the first step is to talk to young people. <laughs> exactly. And I don't know why that's such a hard concept, right? It, it's like such a hard concept, but Christian, you are spot on with that. Okay. I got to move. We don't have a lot of time left. I warned you it would go by super, super fast. What is radical love and how can we all approach work with radical love? What does that look like and what should it look like? 
Yeah, this is this is a great question. This this also makes me I mean, this is something that pretty much all of our guests talked about. And I think much like the conversation about narratives that will resonate with a, a newer generation, I think there's sort of an internal and an external perspective to this, where externally, I think that we need to be thinking about building big umbrellas, big tents that can incorporate all different parts of the movements that we're working on. And I think that oftentimes we get stuck almost infighting or bickering within our movements rather than lifting each other up and finding our place alongside each other, moving toward collective progress. And I think that that, that too is something that's almost easy to overlook because of its simplicity, but can make an enormous difference when it comes to building coalitions, finding pluralism, and ultimately seeing progress. Mm-hmm. Um, and then similarly, in, internally, I, I think it's the same the same trend that we just talked about, right? Where about moving in a way that embodies our destination. I think if we're not practicing love in our day to day work, if we're not looking for opportunities to uplift mm-hmm. one another, we can't expect to find love in the place that we're headed, in the world that we're building. Exactly. You got to walk the walk. Um, Okay, Anam, what does this mean to you? And I'm going to switch the question up a little bit in relationship to how you navigate, you know, your life. You mentioned that you're like in that space where you're moving up. How do you see this being reflected in your in your work? Yeah, I I was in a recent mentoring conversation and, you know, this person very much describing their ex- like work experience in a, in a way that where their identity and worth was tied up with in, like self-worth was tied up with their work success. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard place to be. Right. And some of that, again, to your point, it's like things like get wired into our brains from childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and how do you start to unlearn that where and I think the pieces I'm trying to embody and hold for others is I can still love you and think you're an incredible person, even if you're having a hard time at work and, you know, your performance mm-hmm. isn't on par. And some of that actually comes mm-hmm. from us modeling that and showing that, right? Because mm-hmm. it's very easy in a busy world where all of our lives, you know, we're just trying to get to the next thing. It's like business, 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 right? But to actually show that right. radical love, how do we see people as individuals and in their full selves? Mm-hmm. That isn't just the like, okay, here's the deliverable that you gave me that wasn't quite right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, sometimes again, it comes back to some of those what sometimes can feel simple things, but we easily forget, which is like checking in on how we're doing. Yeah, you know, what's going on inside of our lives? Is your family okay? You know, mm-hmm. are your loved ones good? How's your mm-hmm. kid doing? Mm-hmm. Um, it's those small moments that I think really show that, that radical love. Mm-hmm. I, I have so enjoyed having you on. This has been amazing. And it's, like I said, um, it inspires me for the future of, of what our leadership can be and what, what, um, and, and maybe helping the current generation of leaders, um, really being more confident in bringing up, you know, the next gen leaders that are on the bench or that we haven't really mentored the way we should. Um, and so really a fascinating conversation. Christian Celeste Tate, manager with uh, in New York, the Bridge Span Group, Anam Kadir, senior management, senior, senior manager also in New York from the Bridge Span. Okay, Christian, I got to say, you have been masterful at looping back in your podcasts. I mean, like really good. You were trained points. well. <laughs> oh, holy moly. I was like listening to you and I'm like, I need to do this. I need to do this. But share with us where folks can find this, this amazing podcast series. Thank you for asking. So we've got uh, the podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere that podcasts are. Uh, and it's called Dreaming in Color. So just give it a search. You're looking for the Bridgespan Group. And season four is is airing as we speak. I love it. And if you go to www.bridgespan.org, you can also find uh, the podcast cards beautifully presented. And you can connect through there. And you'll find both of our guests today talking uh, with really profound leaders about really interesting concepts that I think um, most any nonprofit can can 
see the arc of how this is also impacting their organization, whether they've been able to identify it or not. You know, I think you too, sometimes you're in a room, you're in a situation and you get that like weird spidey sense that something's not right and it's not cooking the way it should. And yet you can't really identify it, right? Until maybe you're on your commute home or you're like, oh yeah, now I get it, right? And that's what I loved about these conversations is that it really kind of, um, as you said, I think Christian drew a through line as to what those experiences were and, and what they can be. Um, so the two of you, amazing. I, I, I welcome you back um, to share with us some of your other insights as we move forward. You know, we are here because we have amazing leaders, just like we've had with our guests today. And those presenting sponsors are our leaders in the sector. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episode, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that uh, really have joined us in this process and uh, now more than 1,100 ep episodes. So, um, wow, I really, what a great way to start my Monday, you two. I'm really, really honored and encouraged and uh, really have so enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for your good work and your good thoughts. Thank you again for feel? having us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. It's Thanks, been a Julia. lot of fun. Hey, every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we end with this mantra. And I like to say it means a lot of things, uh, depending on what the show topic and our guests have been. Um, every day I kind of say it and I hear it in a different way. But it's simple. It goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.